want to move you to the point where you go out and you call for John in the darkness. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I threw a blanket around myself and I went outside and I said, John, are you okay? And I heard, no. And I said, where are you? And he said, over here. And I said, keep talking so I can find you. And so he kept saying, over here. And I went out and I found him in the bushes. And the first thing he said to me was, <clears throat> we can't live here anymore. And then he kept asking me, we, are we in Africa? And I would say yes. And John, tell me about your conclusion of her heroic strength of getting you in the car. Well, she's uh, quite a determined little lady. <laughs> but I weigh 127 pounds. And for her, in her beaten up stage, you know, cut in the face and bleeding and, and um, just so demoralized, it's hard for me to think that she could really, in her own strength, pick, pick up my body, haul me out of those bushes. Because you were dead weight. Yes. You could not lift yourself. I could not lift myself. Uh, my legs must have been very sore from all the machete wounds. Uh, especially the cut on this right one, which went right into my kneecap. And uh, so I remember trying to do the best I could, kind of like a crab shuffle with my legs as she lifted me under my armpits. And somehow, I think with Angel's help, she plopped me into that passenger seat, which she had already put in a level position. And Eloise, yeah. do you think you were, there were angels helping oh, you? And when you saw for the... sure, because later on the men that took him out of that vehicle at the hospital could hardly lift him. He was dead weight. For the Bergens, the miracles didn't end with Eloise being able to lift John into the car. The fact that she was even able to drive the vehicle, they say, was God's providence. The car had a manual choke, just like in the old days. Well, Eloise wouldn't have known anything about that. She'd never seen that. And it was hard to get it, get it into reverse. Yeah. So and, I uh, had a refresher course that morning on that exact road. So that was God doing a miracle. So. so Another God incident, you believe, is that the extent of the machete wounds did not amputate your limbs, right? That I cannot understand because one swipe of a machete will sever your legs, arms, or whatever. How it, many swipes did you have? And I had nine, nine marks, nine cuts along my, my knees, and one quite deep into my, into my uh, kneecap. The doctor said if it had been on top instead of at the bottom, I would, I would have been forever trying to heal. And, uh, they also cut me in other parts, but these, these, these knee area, it, it seemed obvious that they were trying to cut my knees. When they arrived at the hospital, doctors wondered if John would survive. There were hospital transfers, and after hours of surgery and hundreds of stitches to close their wounds, Eloise and John are almost scar-free just eight weeks after the horrific incident. From their hospital beds, they spoke a message of forgiveness in Jesus' name. There was a Kenyan pastor and his wife, his family, and they brought a whole bunch of other people. So there were people all around my bedside one day uh, uh, before I was able to sit up. I was lying down, and the pastor talked about forgiveness. And I thought, yes, that's what I need to do. And, and so. I said, okay, I want you guys to be my witnesses as I forgive these men for what they did to me. So I, I called our guards by name and I said, I forgive you um, uh, for not protecting us. I forgive you. Then I was talking to the tall guy that raped me. I said, I let it go. I, I let it drop. Mm -hmm. And then I talked to the short, mean one who seemed to be the leader that did all the punching and the choking and the cutting. I said, I, I forgive you, I let it go. And for a second, I thought I was done. And then God reminded me, no, you're not done. What about your husband? I, so I said, oh, I, 
I just about forgot I need to forgive them for what they did to my husband. And that's when I just started crying from my gut. And I, I just cried and cried, but I got all the words out of forgiveness to all these men. And John, you have intentions. If you could see those criminals who attacked and brutalized you that night, what would you want to say to them? Well, I have a process in operation right now to prepare for that moment. I have a man, a Kenyan, a black uh, policeman uh, slash preacher. <laughs> he is authorized to go into the prisons and to minister and counsel the prisoners. And so I've asked uh, and left word that he is supposed to go to the ones that brutalized us and share the love of God through Jesus Christ with them so that they can come to know him and find forgiveness and find eternal life and, and, and salvation and joy and, and the love of God which we sometimes take for granted once we've been in it for so long and so they're going to email us as soon as there are positive reports coming out of the jail where these men are incarcerated. And then when we go back there, the plan is to connect with these men and to hug them and tell them how much Jesus loves them and that we forgive them for what they did and that we want them only, only to get to know our Lord. Jesus, the Messiah, because that's where life is, that's where forgiveness is, that's where beginnings can take place. Eloise, is that your plan also? Yes, I would like to tell them that they can be free, that from all the voices in their heads, from all the hate and the anger, and that yeah. Jesus loves them. When Listen Up returns, forgiving may be the right choice, but it isn't always the easy one. Forgiving has been the hardest thing for all of us to do, because we had to forgive too. Closed captioning provided by Duca Financial Services Credit Union. Discover more affordable banking at duca.com.